We made it! Blake, we did it! We're on episode 50, holy crap! <laughs> okay, so, for a 50 special episode 50 special thing for you, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna look at VR. I mean, there's really nothing else in the news this week other than VR stuff. So, why don't you sit down, we're gonna celebrate a year, we're gonna do it. Human Factors Cast starts right now, let's do it. to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Well, I got to tell you, Blake, nothing says one year more than not reading the show notes and just winging it as, uh, as we saw just a couple minutes ago. I totally winged nope. the... I know. Uh, no better entrance. There's definitely no doubt. That was pretty good. I know, well, yeah. I mean, we have to go. We have to. We have to go crazy now because it's one year. But anybody, but anybody. But wow, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm so wired, Blake. I, we got to get into the show, man. You ready? He's going off the rails, ladies and gents. <laughs> I know we're we're like two minutes in and we're already off the rails. Let's do it. All right. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Good morning to each one of you. How are you? Good morning. Where are you? So for me, it is about one o'clock in the morning in Ireland. Oh, so man. It's, it's Wednesday morning, the 25th, I think. Yeah. Anyway. Blake, are you telling so, me I'm talking to you from the future? Basically, yeah. This is a podcast done in the future. <laughs> wow. I have to know what happens in the next like eight hours of the day. Um, well, we're going to tell you some good stories. That's about all I know for right now. All right. Well, that sounds good to me, man. Well, let's break it down. So, uh, I want to know what's going on in Ireland. What's going on with you, man? Oh, man. So just been out here visiting some family. Um, and actually over the weekend, I had a pretty insane VR experience that I had not ever really expected and came out of a museum nonetheless. Wow. So, yeah, so down in Waterford, I think Hang it's on. called Waterford, Ireland. Hey, Blake, before you continue, though, I just have to temper our audience's expectations for this episode. There's sure. a There's a lot of VR news this week, and even our banter is going to be VR. So if that's not your cup of tea, uh, just turn the volume down and let this play out, so that way, you know, we still get our listens and whatnot, but you don't have to listen to the whole episode of VR is not your cup of tea. <laughs> Very true. It's a man. VR heavy Believe episode. Or not, we didn't plan for it all to be VR either. No. That just happened to be the role of the dice through and through. Yeah, sometimes uh, there are these serendipitous occurrences in the universe. And the fact that it's all VR news this week, well, pretty much. There's a couple other non VR news, but it, it pretty much all uh, sort of converges on VR. So, all right. So you had this VR experience in a museum. Yeah, so in uh, in this town that we were in over the weekend, there was a museum that was all about Viking history. And I saw that in like one small room, they had a VR setup going on. Uh, so I went in, put on the Oculus Rift, and sure enough, it was just like a small little video of basically just how, I don't know, how Vikings like launch ships into the sea and also like the building of some of their ships and a little little taste of some norse mythology but i thought it was a really cool use of vr as like another educational tool but also like interactive inside of a museum so it's yet again seeing just vr everywhere in the world not just in video games right so i have to ask you this is so have you you experienced vr when you came over to my house you tried a couple games in vr uh is this is this a, a still a relatively novel experience for you uh, definitely still a novel experience for me because I think aside from trying out with you, I, I I went to like one meetup in San Diego, which I was trying out different VR things. But again, that was in the in the vein of just like video game experience. Right. Uh, but yeah, this would maybe be the second or third time. So very okay. novel for me. Okay. And how was it the second or third time you did it? Oh, actually, this setup, because I've never used an Oculus, and the Oculus seemed a little bit um, overbearing for the face. I'm not sure 
what that was about and how they had it tethered didn't it just didn't feel that great wearing it as opposed to like your, your PSVR headset that I'd worn before. Um, but in terms of like the immersiveness of it, uh, it was beautiful to look at like whatever, whatever engine oh, yeah. all that stuff is built on. It's, it's amazing. Um, but we actually, we have a story later on that touches on like the lack of tactile feedback and touch inside of like kind of most VR experiences now. And I think that that was definitely what was missing from this because like you could you could reach out and touch like boats and oars and things oh, like that, man. but that you weren't feeling anything, so it was very empty. But other yeah. than that, it was it was a pretty stunning visual experience, no doubt. Well, you said uh, boats and oars. Now, could you like reach out and grab the oar and kind of like rotate it with your controller and kind of see etchings on it or something? Is that you could you could like basically walk around the entire ship. Um, and like change your view based on where you looked and you could put your hand on the side of the boat and like almost walk, like just thinking you were like walking down with your hand sliding on it. Um, but it didn't feel like anything. So it takes away from the emergency. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, well, man, I, so before we get into, to what I'm excited about this week, um, I just want to comment. This is our 50th episode. That's a huge milestone. For uh, podcasts, I think most podcasts don't make it past episode what five or something. So uh, we're we're doing good. <laughs> we actually have listeners now, which is crazy uh, compared to when we started. And speaking of when we started, this is I think we we missed our one year last week, but uh, it's been about a year since we started the podcast. And I know you've been with us uh, shortly after we we started, but uh, you know it has been a year since human factors cast started and i was going to play some really awkward clips of me and billy starting out but i think i'll spare everybody's eardrums and if you just want to if you want to experience that go (laughs) go into the archives and find our first episode and just listen to how awkward it was as we talked about pokemon go and what a human factor is and it's ugh, and the audio quality i just uh i can't i can't all right so (laughs) it's just one of those things folks uh but yeah a year, we made it. So cheers. I I wish I had some champagne or something. <laughs> I, sh- I should have been more prepared. But uh, let me let me take a a quick detour. And um, so normally we talk about these experiences, right? But I'm going to kind of take a a, um, a different approach this week and uh, go into pop culture, right? Because we're always talking about experiences, and this is ties in well to what we're talking about today. I'm very excited over this Ready Player One trailer that dropped this weekend at Comic Con. Did you see this, Blake? Uh, I saw the ads for it, but I haven't actually watched the trailer because I, I I didn't really know what Ready Player One was. Is it is it a book or what's going on? So it's a book being converted to a movie, uh, like most Hollywood studios like to do. But um, the the premise behind the book is that it's the year twenty forty something. And, uh, you, you know, every, the real world sucks so much that there's this virtual world that everybody plugs into and you have varying degrees of fidelity, right? So you have the full haptic rigs where people fully jack into this environment and their movements mirror the movements in the, in the virtual environment. Um, and everybody does, it's like Facebook, but for, for VR, right? So there's this, this guy who basically made the oasis which is this virtual world where you can create anything and there's you know all these 80s pop culture references 80s and 90s and it's just a love letter to all these franchises right and um without giving away the story for those of you who haven't read the book uh they they go into it's kind of like a hunt for easter eggs throughout the whole thing but there's more stakes writing on it than just the easter eggs you know, it, it, there's like a fortune behind it. Anyway, so it's uh, it's all about this virtual environment and kind of how it, these virtual environments can be anything you want them to be. And uh, interesting. So, so the trailer dropped, and this thing's got the DeLorean from Back to the Future in it. It's got the Iron Giant in it. It's got uh, Deadshot and Harley Quinn, Harley Quinn in it. It's got um. Gandalf is in there at one point. Freddy Krueger, like you name it, like it's all just a hodgepodge of '80s and '90s references that will make any nerd like myself super happy. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm gonna have to check out the trailer things. That sounds pretty interesting. You definitely do. And uh, 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's good. It's good. All right. Well, I think we have done enough talking. I think we should get into the news. What do you think? Let's kick off episode 50 with some news, man. All right. This is the part all about Human Factors News. This could be anything from medical... No, it's not. It, it, it's not going to be anything. It's just going to be VR. All right. What, like, what do we got up first? <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So if you guys thought that Google Glass was killed by a lack of practicality and private concerns, well, think again. So Alphabet's, Alphabet's Google Mo- Alphabet X, Google's Moonshot branch, has unveiled a reboot of the original eyeglass-like wearable called Glass Enterprise Edition. And as the name suggests, it's not aimed at the public at all. So despite many of its problems, Glass turned out to be very useful for workers. So the new version actually just targets businesses to help workers do their jobs better. Alphabet X has said in a statement that we've made improvements to the design and hardware so that it's lightweight and comfortable for long-term wear. We've also increased the power and the battery life as well. So as for whether Google Glass will ever return to sale to public to the public again you can't count on that anytime soon still the consumer glass team which is a separate entity from the enterprise group is alive and kicking so i guess never say never now nick i don't know if you ever got to play with some glass but i remember the last time that i saw this was when i was an intern at nasa and a friend of mine was interning at google and I just remember a very clunky experience, especially for somebody who actually wears glasses, so putting glasses on top of glasses. Uh, so I was really surprised to even see this come back in a different form. Well, I think, so, yeah, Google Glasses just, it it wasn't very well, I don't want to say it wasn't thought out. I, it, it just, it wasn't very successful at what it aimed to do, right? The general public wasn't ready for it. Um, the technology wasn't ready for it. It just didn't do the things it set out to do. And that's why they shut it down. Now, with that being said, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole swath of research research that needs to be done on, um, you know, integrating augmented reality into the workplace. And there are some very exciting projects out there that are working on this exact thing. How can you incorporate, uh, augmented reality into uh, manufacturing plants, um, other industrial settings where perhaps it it could benefit the workers. So this is really exciting to me. I don't need it to be, you know, my own personal headset. But the fact that they're going to put these out there in the wild, and well, at least in in uh, manufacturing plants or whatnot, as they describe in this article, that's exciting to me. The fact that people want to use augmented reality in these settings is exciting to me. Yeah, I mean, I just think it says a lot for the ability of what you can do with a big company, right? I mean, Google obviously launched this as a consumer product, but saw that, okay, this is not being nearly as successful as we had hoped in the consumer realm, but they were able to retarget their actual audience from having a product out in the real world. And notice that, okay, this might not be initially where we thought it was going to in terms of like people making apps for it for consumers, but this works in a whole different realm that we maybe didn't project. I mean, because they talk about a couple of different companies like DHL that use apps that have been created for Google Glass for things like receiving instructions on where items have to be placed or just giving you visual aids as you go through a set of steps in a processing plant. Um, so, I mean, it's it's got really cool uses. And then they even bring up some of the aspects of how it can be used in healthcare um, to kind of, I don't know, allow doctors to take note, to take like mental notes or I guess record sessions while they're sitting with patients. So it stops them like having to fill out a bunch of paperwork or different things like that. So right. I don't know. I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, I guess it's kind of unfortunate that some companies will launch products like Google Glass or anything you really think of. But in, in a case like Google, you have the money and the ability to, all right, step back. Let's look at what we actually did, how it was received. Was there anybody that, that got any use for it? And obviously they, they've they come back at the market with a whole different, you know, tar- target audience. Right. Now, I got to say, man, this is super exciting to me, <laughs> if not for the reason that, VR and AR 
are rich with human factors problems to solve. And it's part of the reason why I got into the field is because there are so many problems, right? Like how do you solve the occlusion problem, especially with augmented reality? If you're looking at something on the floor, how do you, how do you sort of, uh, and it's occluded by something else. How do you both indicate that it is there, but also that it is occluded by some other object? There's a bunch of cognitive problems that you have to solve about how people per- perceive objects in augmented reality. How do you give instructions in augmented reality? There are so many things that I wish I could talk about and and elaborate on about this, but this is so cool. I'm very excited. Yeah, I am too, and I'm I'm kind of excited to see what the market for the applications that are being developed for, like this Google Glass Enterprise Edition, how far they go and how good they get. Because I mean, at some point, you'll probably be able to see see like what companies are how companies are using this Enterprise Glass, and maybe that'll help spawn maybe the consumer creativity as well. For sure, for sure. You got anything else on this one? I do not. All right, let's move on to the uh, fragmented VR market. All right, so our first major virtual reality story of the evening or morning, depending on where you are. So virtual reality is very much in the mainstream of technology these days. And we've got major headset companies like Oculus Rift and HTC Vive now increasingly in consumers' hands. And there's even a flourishing market in the lower end. So you've got the Samsung VR and Google's Daydream leading the way. But with so many different platforms, the VR market is getting increasingly fragmented. So one company, however, is planning on producing a headset that can run not just one major VR platform, but all three. So including Oculus, Steam VR, and Daydream. What's more, it's positional tracking and and it has an eight-hour battery life. And while it can be used with Steam VR while tethered to a PC, it can also be a standalone while on Android. This uh, new headset is made by Game Face Labs, and it promises to be the one headset to rule them all. Now, this one I was super excited about, because even though I'm, like we talked about earlier, I'm pretty much a noob when it comes to VR or really having VR experiences. But this is something I've thought about the the entire time as we've kind of like watched VR grow, especially talking about like the, the Vive and the Riff, or Rift. Just because they, they're they built by two very big companies and you'll have like exclusive content on each one. But then you've also got these lower-end VR sets. Um, and it just feels like there's a, there would be a giant divide in how they progress like by leaps and bounds, but they very, be very separated from each other. So I feel like this company and their singular VR headset brings, I don't know, can bring a lot of people into VR without having as big of a cost margin. Right. So I want to back up really quick. You said uh, that, you know, one thing that you're constantly thinking of is how sort of all these VR platforms are different from each other and there needs to be some sort of uh, united front. And I just want to talk about a little bit about how these are different. Right. So not only is there different hardware in each headset. Right. And that's that's a relatively minor problem to solve. Um, you just get the highest resolution headset. Now, the, the real problem comes from the tracking methodology as well as the uh, the interaction methods as well. So take something like the HTC Vive where you have four uh, cameras set up in a room and it, it tracks your position within this room, right? Versus an Oculus, I think, has two cameras and... Um, all the way down to something like a Google Cardboard, which doesn't even use a camera. It just uses the accelerometer in your device, right? So there's there's all these varying levels of um, tracking technology. Then you have the interaction technology where you have something like, uh, you know, at the advanced end, you have the Oculus Touch where these are some very sophisticated controllers that, um, you know, that the cameras also track and... You know, the, the buttons aren't the same on every device, uh, all the way down to the Google Cardboard where you just have one button potentially um, or no buttons that you interact with your device with that basically taps the phone. So there are all these different interaction methods, all these different tracking methods. And also there's unique content to each one of these things. And that's part of the big problem right now is that 
uh, you know, when you when you think about VR, there's these studios and and a lot of the times it's like indie studios, right, who can barely afford maybe one VR headset to test with. So they pick one and make it an exclusive on that on that uh, platform, right? So they can only afford an Oculus, so they buy an Oculus and then they test it with the Oculus. And so it works with the Oculus and so they make it for Oculus. But if they if they had something like this device that we're describing in this in this um, uh, story, they they can basically test it on all platforms uh, with the varying degrees of interaction, the varying degrees of uh, motion tracking, um, and uh, potentially throw it out to all these content providers like Steam or the Google Play Store or whatever it is that you get it through, and be playable on all these devices or the device that we're mentioning here. So this is, this is very exciting to me. I love this. Yeah. And I think you make a really good point about uh, having this all inclusive device is probably the best way for people to be able to create content. That's going to be viable across all the platforms for one, but they make a really good point within the articles talking about the fact that a lot of the studios that are actually pushing content right now, like they're not the big heavy hitter or triple A studios. They're like they're indie studios and they can't afford to drop like the 10 to 15 grand on just one type of headset. And this will allow them to, you know, get one headset that actually allows, allows them to look at how their games will be played on different platforms or just develop games specifically for, one platform be it like oculus or be it one of the lower fi uh, but right. actually have something that lets them test it and create the best content that they can right and this uh, this whole platform exclusivity where you can only play a game on a certain vr platform or you can only experience it in some way um it really kind of hampers the growth right and so by unifying all these all these uh vr headsets into one uh, you know, it, it potentially will help the the whole home VR field grow. I mean, it, the the problem right now is the content, right? Like I could tell you, I have like five or six games for my VR, uh, for my VR headset, and it's like, okay, well, once you play through it, you're done. But there are, there are so many more that I wish I could play, and because they're indie studios, you know, they they have to charge for the work that they put in. And maybe if if they had something like this, they could reduce the price across all the platforms and then it'll give a bunch of people a, a, a lower cost of entry to experience these things. And, you know, potentially the word of mouth will get around and everybody will want to try it. And then it, it just it there's no bad thing about this. <laughs> I'm trying to find a negative other than the obviously the uh, the the exclusives will you know eventually find themselves either i don't know i i can see you know the major headset makers htc oculus i can see them being upset with this because then there will be no exclusives that drive people to their platform but then they just have to iterate on the hardware and make the hardware the thing that the people want so i don't know yeah, I mean, they. I, there's like ways around that though, because maybe if they get this to the point where the content's being released, you know, similar to how you have, we've got like the PS4 versus Xbox One, um, like some release earlier on one platform versus the right. other, those kinds of things, or maybe like, you get different in-game content that's special to one headset versus the other. If it's if it gets to like, how are they going to stay competitive with each other? I, well, yeah. I don't know. I think I really agree with you. I think this just drives. Um, getting better content across all the different platforms and making it more accessible, not just to people who want to want to use VR headsets for entertainment, but also the creators themselves who want to get started and be making like triple a content where they couldn't before. Yeah, I agree. Well, let's move on to our next story because it has to do with VR as well. Surprise, surprise. Oh yes. All right. So keeping in line with advancements in VR, let's talk about touch and tactile feedback. So when it comes to VR, it's a problem that none of the companies so far have quite cracked. So you can crank up, crank a VR headset's resolution as high as you want and push the frame rate past what the human eye can see. But alas, when the user reaches out and feels nothing but air, the sense of immersion is all but lost. Well, you can always leave it up to MIT to step in and continue to push the cutting edge of any technology, and in this case, in VR. 
So at TechCrunch's sessions, MIT's Media Lab researchers premiered a portable wheeled robot called the Shape Display that follows a user's hand in order to simulate a surface or object that your VR self is touching. So for now, this remains a pet research project, but may spur further development as VR keeps moving forward. Now, even though this is kind of kind of like a cumbersome thing, I guess, to have a robot that runs around with you while you're uh, in a VR, like in a virtual environment, I think that this this design and the idea is perfect to like keep to take immersion in the VR world to the next level. Because I, like I was talking about, I guess uh, in our earlier section i i really think that that's kind of what makes or breaks an experience sometimes for me yeah i'm about to get weird i'm about to get weird on this uh so if you're listening with small children in the car or something i suggest you fast forward about 30 seconds uh blake you ever want to touch a virtual booby because that's what this gif reminds me of oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) they have they so this this gif in the article uh has basically uh, a man sort of moving his arm forward over a ball. And I mean, there's a lot to be said about the future of where that kind of stuff is going. Um, I said 30 seconds, so I'm going to, I'm going to keep it contained here. Uh, so welcome back. But I, I, there's a lot to be said about where that technology is going and this definitely gets at it. And I mean, it, it goes beyond that, but I can see that as one of the predominant ways of why, you know, potentially people look into this, but you also have the examples like you were talking about at the top of the show where, you know, you went to this Viking exhibit and you wish that you could reach out and touch the boat and something like this would have been perfect for that. Yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, this, this one really struck me because it is like a portable little robot that you could move around that seems to be easily picked up and taken with you. Um, but, but again, I mean, this is like a pet research project that's not going to go into any kind of full-scale production. But I think it'll, especially with what comes out from the MIT Media Lab, we'll start seeing more of these, okay, how do we, how do we add the, the feeling of touch to different VR games? I mean, you've, you definitely have a really good point. Uh, there could be definitely some reasons for it that, <laughs> that are not like going to be the widespread public's in for the widespread public's enjoyment. But I think like making games more immersive or even making training modules more immersive, like giving people almost like that negative feedback. If you did something wrong or if you potentially may have had your hand crushed by a machine type of thing, I I think there's a lot of cool implications for it. Yeah. There's, there's definitely this lack of um, sort of feedback in VR, especially tactile feedback. And there's a lot of people trying to, solve this problem and this is one of those solutions you know i've also seen um sort of exoskeletons that stop your hand from going a certain distance if it you know it, if it senses something in the virtual environment and it pulls back on your hand so that way you feel like you're touching like you really you, you can't physically move your hand forward did we talk about that on the show i feel like we talked about something like this on the show before um, we definitely have for sure yeah so so there's a ton of different ways and this is just another way to th- this to me um, especially so let's describe this this apparatus here it's it's basically a robot on wheels that's kind of elevated and it has a bunch of um what would you call these like uh cube uh, cuboid they're they're rectangles that like pop up out of this thing yeah they're like cuboidal projections kind of like if i i can't think of the name of what of like the toy or whatever but if you guys remember in the nineties, like there was it I think it was like a piece of glass with metal push pins in it, and you could like put your hand in there and the the metal push pins would go around your hand and you could see a reflection of your hand. I mean that that's kind of what it's like. Yeah, it's the classic pin art is um what the toy oh, I don't know, I just Googled it. But yeah, I, that's that's basically what it is, but in reverse where it pushes on your hand. And you can imagine the resolution on this is not that great right now. It's just a bunch of you know, blocks, but you can imagine that if it were push pins or something like that, you could get a lot more finer resolution at the tactile sense, especially on something like your hands where you can detect those small minute differences. And if you were operating on something in the virtual environment, you could actually, you know, get that fine resolution detailed feedback, which would be really cool. And so there, there could definitely be a use for something like this. Yeah. And you know, I think be because, 
like they even mentioned in the article that this is only like a, a beginning research project. It's not going to go too much further as far as this model. I feel like them getting more fine details into the feedback that it gives you as far as haptics. That's that's when we'll start seeing like maybe a production of an actual robot. Oh yeah, yeah. All right. Well, uh, do you have anything else to say on this uh, VR touch display? <laughs> No, I, I just hope that we see more cool stuff like this that's easily portable for VR. Man, I do too. All right. Well, I just want to take a quick minute to thank all of our friends at Engadget, Gizmodo, IEEE, and TechCrunch for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can follow us on all our social media for links to these original articles, and we post those as we find them. So um, just stay tuned throughout the week, and, and uh, you can stay up to date. So that way you know what we're talking about on the show. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? Let's talk some nerd stuff. Oh, yes. So, for all you ultra nerds out there, this one's for you guys. Okay, so Dungeons & Dragons is intrinsically a very physical experience. You're surrounded by pins, stacks of paper, and ruled books, rolling dice, talking and talking to your friends. But Wizards of the Coast is playing to modernize the way fans play the game with the introduction of Beyond. Beyond is a new app that wants to help balance the physical experience of role-playing D&D, with a decluttered all-digital support system. So product lead Adam Bradford says that the focus is to make the game management easier for players, both at the table and in between game sessions. At the launch, a game game rules compendium with all D&D sourcebooks in digital format will be available, as well as character builder, digital character sheets, homebrew content creation, and the early stages of campaign management. Now, I have to say, since we decided to talk about you and Billy's first episode, this is one that I would wish he was here to weigh in on, because I know that he's a DM himself. Well, uh, funny you should say that, because Billy still has access to our old uh, Facebook account. It's not old. We still are on Facebook. He still has access to it. And uh, someone on it, on our Facebook, commented with, very unfortunate it doesn't support 3.5, right? And uh, he at least had this to weigh in. And uh, we can at least uh, get Billy's input on this. 3.5 had the OGL, which made all the rules open for everyone. But once you let the cat out of the bag, it can't be put back in. And Wizard was hesitant to put time into a product that had free competition online. So uh, that's Billy's thoughts. Um, But yeah, no, this is awesome. This is uh, Nerds Everywhere Rejoiced. Yeah, no kidding. I'm super excited about it because it's like making it easier to play Dungeons and Dragons on the go, it sounds like. Yeah, so one of the... um, Have you played D&D before, Blake? I've played it at least once. Okay, so you know the frustration of like handling your character sheet and bringing that with you to every game and uh, your bag of dice and your minis and all that stuff. Like, obviously, it's fun to have those tactile things, and that's part of the charm, but... Um, you know, some of the last couple games that I played, everyone was using digital dice rollers and, you know, if they have that built in and if they have like character management and everything is defined by the rules, it just makes more sense. It just, it it makes more sense. And these sort of, these sort of companion apps for tabletop games are great. I think they're, they're wonderful because it helps, especially if it has a good user experience behind it it can really sort of bring these tabletop games, which are a ton of fun and really valuable for building social sort of relationships with others in personal physical space. It can, if it's done well, it can, it can facilitate these even, even more so. Oh, sure. And I mean, traditionally wishes of the coast when they've made digital products, they do a really good job. Like, I mean, Magic the Gathering Online is is very well done and it or it has been since like they did the companions for Xbox and then when they moved to mobile, same thing. And I know Curse, the uh development company they're working with, like they've made a lot of great great products, so, like in combination with WoW and things like that. So I, I don't know. I'm excited to see what it looks like and feels like when it actually launches. Um, cause it, it sounds like it's got everything that's going to make the game easier for you to travel around and keep track of it, uh, without any of the hassle. I, I can see still wanting to have some of the physical experience. Cause that's kind of like, I don't know, that's, that's just the, the typical Dungeons and Dragons epitaph, but still, I think some people will be excited to move a little forward in the digital age. Yeah, for sure. 
for sure. Um, all right. Well, I don't have other anything else to say about this other than this is awesome, and I cannot wait to try this. And also, you know what we should do, man? We should like make it a reward for our Patreon subscribers. Anyone who does, what, like 15 a month gets to play a D&D game with us. That'd be fun. We'd get Billy in on here and just... Uh, that would be epic. Oh, my god! So if gosh. anybody wants to throw the 15 in, I'll see you in a and d game. Yes, we will see you in a and d game. We should do, like, just play-alongs, like D&D or, uh, you know, even, even Xbox or PlayStation. We should just have play-along for our Patreon subscribers. There you go. Coming to you guys soon, some play-alongs for some <laughs> Patreon. All right, so let's go ahead and get into this last story. Oh, man, this one is this one's really cool. All right, so stepping away from VR for a little bit. So researchers have made a low-cost low smart glove that can translate American Sign Language alphabet into text and send messages via Bluetooth to a smartphone or computer. In tests, the glove could translate all 26 letters of the American Sign Language alphabet into text, and the research team also used the glove to control a virtual hand to sign the ASL, letter, ASL letters. The glove can also be used as a to control a virtual hand. While this advancement in gesture tracking glove technology can certainly aid the deaf community, its developers also say that the smart glove could prove really valuable for virtual and augmented reality, re- remote surgery, and defense uses like controlling bomb-diffusing robots. So this this is blowing me away because, one, I didn't really realize that this glove, what do they call it? They call it gesture tracking glove technology, was so had already existed in the past. But not only that, that, they've advanced it so far that it can pick up on American Sign Language, turn it into a text message, and send it through Bluetooth. Like, this this one just blows me away. Yeah, this is, this is awesome. This is Power Glove 2.0, and... Uh... While not directly related to virtual reality, they do mention that, you know, they could be used for bomb defusal, which you would do presumably through, um, you know, telepresence, uh, surgery as well. So, you know, the, the technology is there, but this is awesome to me. I love the whole accessibility sort of uh, approach that people are taking and trying to solve problems for these, but also for these um, for these individuals who you know, uh, are at a disadvantage. And so by doing that, they're solving bigger problems, right? And not to say that um, disabled individuals are disadvantaged. What am I trying to say? (laughs) I'm trying to say that, not that they're not big problems, but other problems are being solved in addition to these problems. There we go. Yeah, indeed, man. I mean, the... and. The insane thing is this sounds like such a far jump in the technology because the article talks about how they use just a lot more tactile sensors, which which is really what's allowing them to gather all this hap- – gather and give haptic feedback to their users, but also gather enough information to tell, okay, this is the symbol that's being signed so I can translate that into – basically code that turns into a text message that can be sent – but also, not only that, they've developed specific moldable um, polymers that they use in these gloves, where before these things would be very rigid and um, right. hard to use, not very, not very, um, I guess, formable to your hand. So, I mean, they've obviously taken the time to look at the existing models, kind of doing a, com- a competitive analysis of, okay, this is, here's really the problems that we're seeing, like, maybe from a heuristic point of view of what gloves have been in the past, what can we do to change it? Um, so not only like is the technology there, but obviously they're creating new materials that allow them to just make this idea even, even more expansive. The, the one question I do have, and it, the article doesn't really address it. Um, cause, cause obviously being able to translate deaf people's signing into text and messages is, amazing but I, i'm having a hard time understanding the how it bridges the gap into i guess the virtual and augmented reality well i i think that comes down to uh sort of just translating hand movements into i mean if they can if they can detect what sort of uh what letters these asl speakers can you call it ASL speaking, ASL signers? If they can detect what letter they're saying, they have that fine enough resolution, and they probably have data 
on all of the gestures being made, right? And so just by importing that into a virtual environment, you may be able to get the resolution in a virtual environment where you actually see your fingers moving. So I don't know. Oh, that's a that's a really good point. I mean, it, at the very least, with the data that it's collecting, because, I mean, it, it's talking about how it codes a little bit in the article, which we get, is a little bit beyond me. But I feel like this, from what I've seen of American Sign Language, like the, uh, the basic movements of the hands would give it enough of like kind of a baseline to connect a machine learning, learning algorithm that you could start getting into those fine controlled movements as more people used it over time. So I guess I, guess I could see how this is definitely a, a jumping off point for a lot of different tech. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, one point that uh, one of these commenters on the original article says is uh, it's not actually converting sign language. It's converting ASL finger spelling. And they, they indicate that this is a huge difference, right? So, so they're not doing actual ASL. They're, they're not doing sign language, right? Because they mentioned that uh, sign language is, is much more involved than just the hands. Um, it also has a lot to do with facial expressions as well. And so, you know, there, there's this whole aspect of it that they're not getting, but they do at least get the letters, right? But I can only imagine that as time goes on, the technology will improve and, you know, with advanced, with more advanced sensors, the... Um, the uh, applications of this could be endless, potentially. Yeah, most definitely. Thanks for pointing that out. I actually did not catch that from reading the article. So thanks for pointing out the difference. That's okay, man. That's what other people are here for. <laughs> All right. Well, I that's it for the news this week. That's, I mean... We had a lot of uh, stories that kind of tied back to virtual reality. I guess it wasn't all virtual reality, but uh, still was exciting. Now, I would like to switch gears a little bit, and uh, y- it, it's time to get into that, my favorite part of the show. You ready for it, Blake? Oh, am I ready for it? You know I am. It came from Twitter. Oh, Twitter? That's right. We got one of you guys writing in on Twitter. For the first time. <laughs> That's awesome. Actually, no, it's not our first time. We've had people write in on Twitter before, but it's the first time in a while. So if you want to get <laughs> in on the show, obviously Twitter's the way to go. But uh, Adam Schweitzer hit us up on Twitter earlier today to ask us a question about pursuing a career in Human Factors and Ergonomics or HCI. Adam tweeted, how important will HFE or HCI become in the future? Is it worth studying and pursuing as a career path? And uh, if you guys want to be on the show you can always tweet us your questions we'll answer them live on the show we're at human factors cast with the hashtag hf cast we're actually h factors podcast i think right <laughs> uh but anyway so adam's question how important will hfe or hci become in the future is it worth studying and pursuing as a career path and i say absolutely yes and i'm not biased at all blake what do you say <laughs> uh i see it I don't know. I'd say that it's definitely a great path to go down. Um, I I hate doing this, but it's always one of those where I want to at like ask a question with a question, or answer a question with a question. And it, it's more of like, what do you see? What do you see yourself doing? Um, but I don't know. From my perspective, man, it, it's been really great to have such a big research background and then supplement it with uh, the understanding of human factor human factors uh, methodology. Because uh, because it, it's allowed me to step away from just doing pure research like I had like in the graduate school sense and put my baseline knowledge of understanding how people use software on onto like building front front end web development for applications and web apps. So I I personally I think whether you only do like a strict career in as like a an HF or HCI researcher or if you do it in a more applied realm. Or if you just use it as a baseline to help you jump off and understand how how you can target people with marketing or how to design better um, software, I, I, I don't know. I think the possibilities are endless. I mean, especially since this whole episode is basically about VR, and that's, like you said, only going to bring a plethora of challenges for people like us to, t- to tackle. So I'd say go for it, man. So here's the thing. I'm going to break this question down because it is two questions. So... Uh, the first question is, how important will HFE or HCI become in the future? Well, I argue that it will become increasingly important the more and more we interact with technology and the more ways that we 
sort of established to evolve <laughs> to uh, interact with technology, right? We're going to come up with all these different interaction techniques. And each technique provides its own set of unique challenges, right? So there's the field is always evolving. Uh, we are eventually going to put ourselves out of work with, you know, artificial intelligence and, um, I mean, hopefully not. But our goal potentially is to get us out of work, get ourselves out of work with automation, with with sort of integrating the human. And, and once everything's all peachy keen, then our job is done. But it'll never be that way because then we'll we'll have to shift. We'll have to shift to how do we interact with artificial intelligence? How do we how do we interact with the fact that everything is automated for us and it's all fine and dandy? We can always find ways to streamline the process to make it easier for humans to be lazy, right? So that's kind of my answer to the first one. It will it, it will stay important. The importance won't diminish. The importance won't increase. It will always be a factor. It will always be a steady sort of stream of problems that we're looking to solve. That's my answer to the first one. Is it worth studying and pursuing as a career path? Well, that kind of depends on your own sort of um, I don't know, personality. It takes a special kind of crazy to be in human factors. I think uh, you have to you have to love kind of solving problems that are a little unconventional, right? There's no hard science behind what we do. There's science in the in the sense that you know, we, we do usability studies and we we do research on what the best practices are, but there's no there's no cut and dry method for doing it. And if 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 you're the scientific type who likes hard answers, I don't think this this study this field of study is for you. I think this field of study is for someone who is okay with not getting the perfect solution. It has to be ever evolving. It has to be sort of your best guess because you got to move on and fix other things. At least in my experience, I don't know if you have any other additional uh, details to add to that, Blake. Well, I mean, that you, what you're doing, what you're saying is definitely true. And I think that's kind of the beauty of the field itself. I mean, you get to, you learn the basic methods in school or whatever, but at some point you have to adapt the process to how your company works, or you have to make sure that, you you do just keep moving and launch a minimal viable product and see how it grows. Um, so it's it's definitely, in my opinion, for a much more applied person, not somebody who just really wants, like Nick is talking about, the hard facts. I mean, although there is a lot of research that goes into different HCI and HFE programs, I really think it's the, the most fun to have with it is, is applying it in the field and learning, Absolutely. growing, failing succeeding it's i don't know it's ultimately solving as many problems for people out there as you can whether it be like in software or in accessibility um it's only going to grow yeah well said man uh thanks for tweeting at us adam uh we love hearing from you guys so if you have any questions like we said earlier you can tweet us at h factors podcast with the hashtag hf cast and we'll be sure to answer those on the show so let's get to a reddit post this week this is the part of the show where we search all over reddit to bring you topics the community's talking about any subreddit's fair game as long as it relates to field of human factors and encourages discussion among the community today's entry today's entry was found on the user experience subreddit by from wiki nom nom and uh wiki nom nom asks why is user research important blake i'm gonna let you handle this one Yes. So, Nick, I may have broken the rules a little bit, but I took my own spin on it because we talk about using or grabbing things from Reddit that spark commu- or spark a lot of talking amongst the community. But what surprised me about this question is there was no comments at all. What? No, like nobody had anything to say. So I was like, well, we've got to at least give some light on why user research is important. Because I feel like that's what I have to fight for every time I put together a proposal or sit down with brand new stakeholders. You're always going to have the question of why are you even wanting to do this? What benefit is going to give me? Um, and I think one good example is what we talked about earlier with Google Glass. Like they originally launched a product in which you know they did a heavy amount of research in in the beginning with the goal of, of course, creating a consumer product that would eventually connect all their services to to a different device. So right. instead of the phone, we're looking at glasses. But 
what they didn't anticipate is that they had targeted the wrong population for the wrong use. And it's without doing the analysis of the data they had collected or planning ahead to collect how people were using their technology, they would have just had to scrap an entire project that is definitely worth hundreds of millions of dollars. So if we're talking just at a, at a return on investment standpoint, I mean, the, the most important thing that you can do to give yourself a leg up, even if you fail at the beginning, is start trying to understand who you're targeting. Understand what potential uses for a brand new product that somebody would have, or even understanding what people use in the market now that you're trying to replace or trying to build upon. Uh, I don't know. It's it's odd to me that this question so gets asked or that, uh, I don't know what your experience is, Nick, but it certainly has been mine that a lot of times you have to fight stakeholders tooth and nail over how much research you can do or even doing any at all. Um, but I, I don't know. I just think it's a big, important point to focus on. Like, If you can, do as much research up front as possible. If not, at the very least, if this is all you can do. Throw analytics into your software or throughout the process of the product you're building so that you have some concrete data to point to why you're seeing some of the problems that you're seeing. Yeah, I absolutely. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> I absolutely agree with that. I think... You know, it, it, the whole reason we do this is for the user. Like, don't lose sight of that. Like, you are literally doing this to make sure that the user is going to be taken care of in your product. Because if they are not, if they don't enjoy using your product, then you're not going to have a product. The people aren't going to come to it. That's not going to be a thing. So user research is immensely important just because of that fact alone, right? You want to provide a product that people are using and people won't want to use a stupid, you know, not well thought out product. That's just, that's, that's how it is. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else to say about it. The one other thing I do have that I've, I've kind of like thought about this over the past couple of years since I got out of grad school. And I think, I really think like user research is part of what drives innovation and digital trends. Because I mean, sometimes you don't, you can't understand why people don't like a new piece of software or a new app design or a new menu design and it's only through sifting through different sets of analytics or seeing people actually try and interact with a product or an app or even a physical device that you come up with new solutions just by watching another human interact with something that you had your hands in designing so i i don't know i i think that's another reason why user research is important is it in itself helps drive innovation and keep people pushing forward yeah, I think uh, I think you said it best there. I I don't really have anything else to say on this other than do your user research. <laughs> All right, man, ready to take it home? Oh, let's let's let these folks go. All right, well, that's going to be it for today, everyone. If you have any suggestions for news stories that you think we may have missed, you can head on over to any of our social media. We're on the Human Factors LinkedIn. Facebook or Twitter at H Factors Podcast, like I mentioned earlier, tweeted us with the hashtag H Factors or HFCast. I don't even know our own hashtag. Join the discussion on our SoundCloud, or uh, you can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Uh, you can leave us a voicemail if you're saucy at 901 646 1432. That's 901 646 1 HFC. You can also support us on our Patreon and play D&D with us or online on PS4 or whatever it is. Uh, it's your choice. Donate $15 or more and you can hang out with us. Uh, we bring these things to your ad free, so, you know, do, do what you can. Keep us in the business. Uh, <laughs> be sure to like, subscribe, review us. Make those reviews good on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Armstrong, thank you so much for joining me on the 50th episode of Human Factors Cast. Where can our listeners find you? Oh, you guys can find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Mr. Don't Panic UX over there. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. And until next time, it depends. It depends. It depends. Episode 50. Ah, episode 50. We did it. We did it. We did episode 50. We did it. Now we just have to play D&D &D with our listeners. D&D, &D, we did it. We did it, episode 50, we did it! We did it! It depends! 50 times! <laughs>